So we have seen now how Homo economicus was born, how the uh, ordinal approach uh, had been initiated, but then we have to see how can the rest of economics be built on that basis? How can we develop all the concepts in economics from that new perspective? We start doing that job now. First, we're going to look at how uh, preferences can be justified, because you know, many economic models assume a preference relation, binary preference as a basis. How can one justify that if one uh, in the, this reveal preference uh, approach, reveal preference paradigm, where choice is the basis of everything? We're going to look at that first and imagine so how general choice, why economists are so often only looking at binary choice preference. Imagine you have to choose from four objects A, B, C, D, you choose A. That reveals that you prefer A to B and you prefer A to C and you prefer A to D. It reveals those three binary preferences. Conversely, if you know that those preferences are valid, those binary preferences, then you know that you will choose A from A, B, C, D. So this shows in a very simple way how general choices and binary preferences can be related to each other. In revealed preference theory, we study in general how this works, and what are properties, mathematical properties, empirical properties, things like that. A famous idea in the study came from Samuelson, you heard the name before, his weak axiom of revealed preference, warp. So I'll explain it. Imagine we have a set of things you choose from, and I often use the term prospect, meaning the objects you choose from. In consumer theory, the things you choose from, the, the consumer at least chooses from are commodity bundles. In uh, decision on the risk, there are lotteries, but in general, I use the term prospect often for things to be chosen from. Anyway, so there's some set of prospects, whatever they are, and uh, these are the, this capital X means a set of all conceivable prospects. Then you have to choose from some subset. So maybe a, a, all the conceivable uh, objects are not available when your subset is available and from that subset you have to choose. Then this uh, capital C denotes a choice function. That is, let's assume for every finite subset of the conceivable prospects, you specify what you would choose if that were the set of objects available, prospects available from which could be chosen. At least for every finite subset, let's do it now. So you, you've seen more or less such things in consumer demand theory, where uh, the capital C was demand function, and then you chose from the budget sets. Let's here assume you choose from finite subsets. We keep it a bit simple, the mathematics. And for every finite subset, you choose a non empty subset, what we interpret as the best objects, the best prospects available. Maybe it's one or maybe a few are equally good and they're all the best. That's specified in a subset CA of A. Well, then the weak axiom of real preference says the following in this context it can never happen that there are prospects X and Y. And that two of these sets A and B, finite then, subsets of X, the sets from which you uh, consider uh, choosing from them, such that we have two things. First, when you have to choose from capital A, X is among the ones you're willing to choose, so among the best ones. Y is also contained in A. So, and then we say X is revealed weakly preferred to Y, because if Y is available, but you're willing to choose X, then X must be at least as good as Y. That's how we interpret this. Anyway, further, continue my definition of warp. So one thing is we have this here. The other thing is, if we look at B, Y is chosen from B. In B, X was available, but X is not chosen from B. So that situation is uh, excluded by warp. In this situation, so both, uh, of course, Y is contained in capital B, even in CB. X is also contained in capital B. Oops. Y is chosen from capital B. 
x is not chosen, our interpretation is y is revealed strictly preferred to x. Okay, so warp, it's a long story maybe, but warp says it can never happen that we have these things such that both x is revealed weakly preferred to y, and y is revealed strictly preferred to x. If this were to happen, it would be a bit strange. It would suggest here you think x is better than y, at least it's good, and here you think y is strictly better than x. It seems like a sort of contradiction. So the warp axiom says, such sort of contradiction should never happen. Probably you heard the warp axiom in consumer demand theory. Here we formulate a bit differently for finite sets, but it's the same idea. Now it turns out that uh, some nice result follows. Let me first give some definitions. We say, if we have a binary relation given on that set of all the conceivable prospects, and if we have a choice set C given, the choice function C given, we say that C maximizes the preference relation if the following condition holds. If for every finite subset A of capital X, those prospects in A are chosen that are weakly preferred to all the other prospects. So they are best in this sense. They beat every other one in the binary comparison. That happens, and we say C maximizes that binary relation. So that's a mathematical way how we relate binary relations and choice functions. Quite plausible, of course. And mostly, not exactly, but mostly Sam Wilson proved roughly the following theorem. He said this choice function maximizes a weak order and a weak order that's a binary relation that is transitive and complete. You remember from previous courses, micro one, whatever. So the usual thing, you know, transitivity completeness. The choice function maximizes a weak order if and only if that's equivalent to the warp condition holding. And that's the theorem, these two are logically equivalent. So the warp condition you saw before, and it's sounded plausible, I guess maximizing not only a binary relation, but a binary relation that is weak order. Those two are equivalent, logically equivalent. Maybe you wonder, so what? Why would anybody be interested in that theorem? But this is the work that the ordinal revolution that should be done then. It was, uh, people took choice functions, choice making as the primitive, and everything, whether you assume, you must express in terms of choice function what it means. So if you assume that it's okay to be studying preference relations that are weak orders, that they capture everything relevant, well, can you make that assumption? Is that reasonable? This theorem says it. That is reasonable if and only if the weak axiom of revealed preference holds. So empirically, you can verify or falsify the possibility that choices are maximized by weak order, so that this preference relation that's a weak order captures everything relevant. You can verify or falsify that, if and only if you can verify or falsify the web axiom. The web axiom gives a sort of the empirical meaning of working with binary relations. Then if you say, you can say that it's reasonable to work with these weak orders, if and only if you can say it's reasonable to assume warp. So that shows the empirical content, how to discuss it. And here's a reminder of weak order, what it means. So that was a way to capture the empirical meaning or to justify why so often we use work with binary preference relation, even weak orders. The next job to be done, and you also know, of course, we did enough homework with you calculating your tentative functions. You know that often, not only we're working with preference relations, but even with utility functions to be maximized. So now in the ordinal approach, work to be done. Next question, how can we justify the max, uh, that we assume maximization of utility? The new rule of the game since 1900 or 30, uh, roughly is, then you must express in terms of choices what that means. 
where we've justified that we work with preference relation weak orders. And then in terms of weak orders, you must be able to express what it means to assume the, ex the existence of utility. How can you verify falsify it? Let us look at that now. The next job to be done by the new approach, the ordinal approach to build up the economic model, justify the use of utility. And in a way, binary preference or binary utility, you could say unitary evaluation. You evaluate every choice object, every prospect just by itself. That's one way of putting it. Anyway, definition, utility function represents binary relation if we have the following equivalence. In the binary comparison, X is weakly preferred to Y, if and only if X, X has the bigger utility. So the very natural way to do. This is how utility and binary relations can be related to each other. And probably, well, in such a situation, we call you the utility function. And you will remember from other courses, this implies that the binary relation is a weak order. Theorem, and you had it before in micro one or whatever. The preference relation is a continuous weak order. So transitive complete and continuity. I'm not going to be very technical. I will not give the definition, but you had it before, otherwise you take it for granted. This assumption is equivalent to the binary relation maximizing a continuous utility function being represented by it. I use those terms interchangeably more or less. So you can justify the assumption of utility if and only, well, continue, we take continuity for granted, okay? So then you can justify it, if and only if you can justify weak ordering, transitivity completeness. And that transitivity completeness, we already know how to justify it, that's okay. So here we see how we can verify or falsify the existence, the properness of using utility functions. You've seen this theorem before, and maybe before you thought, so what? You shrug your shoulder. Why are people writing this theorem? What is interesting about it? But now you see how this historically played a role. This is what the ordinalists had to do to justify the use of utility. If we had not had this theorem, the ordinalists would not have wanted you to speak about utility function. Then if you assume that these uh, consumers are maximizing utility, the ordinalists would say, we don't know what you're talking about. You didn't give a broken meaning, falsifiability. You didn't specify it. We don't want to hear about it. So now you see this theorem was crucial in the ordinal spirit to make it possible to use utility. So in that sense, it was historically an important result. It sometimes they say, they call that a behavior foundation. If you give axioms that are necessary and sufficient for something, and those axioms are all eminently observable. They make things empirically meaningful. Then people use the term behavior foundation or axiomatization something sometimes for such a result. Now you understand better why that theorem that you saw with Michael one, why that is a very important theorem historically. Mas Kolel, you probably had Michael from that book. They used the term irrational for uh, weak orders for transitivity completeness. It's uh, it's unfortunate the term rational should not be used that way. It was a bit naive, if I may say so, that they did. Anyway, they did use that term. So you've seen it before, and it was, I don't like the term, but so be it. Well, so now I showed you how utility and preference, everything can be justified uh, in the ordinal spirit, can be related to a choice. And it means this is sort of if and only if utility means what we saw before, no less and no more. Any interpretation, if you're going to say, oh, this is about a uh, utility captures happiness, the ordinance will say, wait a minute, we never said that. We show how it is related to choice, and that's all we say. We have no clue what happiness means. We don't know how to observe it from review preference or how to interpret it. Utility is utility, no more, no less. If you want to speculate about emotion in the heart, well, that may be useful and psychology may do it, but don't call it economics. So that's a very narrow interpretation of utility, but also very unambiguous. The 
or their own spirit. With all the pros and cons, many pros. This utility function, we did the term ordinal. It is ordinal in a mathematical sense. Then it means the only thing that matters of this utility function is how it orders the prospects. Difference in the ordering don't matter. Only if two plus which one is bigger, that's the only thing you want to know. That means that every strictly increasing transformation of the utility function gives you again another utility function because it orders all the prospects the same way. And that's the only thing that matters. So the only thing that matters about utility, how it ordered things, and any strictly increasing transformation doesn't change anything relevant. That's the mathematical meaning of the term ordinal. It's also in a conceptual sense, uh, or the term ordinal is often used to refer to that, being that utility is what it is, no more and no less. It's a representation of choice making and nothing more. Any interpretation that that will be a quantitative index of happiness or introspection, how you feel in your heart, economists didn't want to hear about it. It was taboo saying anything in that direction. That was the conceptual sense in which the term ordinal was used and is used still. And also people often call this the ordinal approach. The Homo economicus was born, the ordinal revolution. This term and this spirit is why people use, uh, uh, call it that way. Anyway, many more results were derived from this ordinal basis. When in 1934, there was a Hicks and Allen paper that was very important for the ordinal approach to be generally accepted. They showed it in a quite rich model, in market model with all kinds of consumers, supply demands and all kinds of things. The only thing you need to know about utility is its ordinal nature. And you can derive everything you want demand, meet supply, whatever you want to do. You don't need to know more about utility than its ordinal nature. So that was a very important result. And economists felt even much, this was maybe the ordinal approach was only really accepted when this result and a few similar results came. It was historically very important. Now we continue, there's much more to be done in economics, risk, time, how do you, welfare, all these things, how can all these things be justified in the ordinal spirit that's work awaiting us, work done in the ordinal approach. Of course, I'm showing you now very valuable, positive results, how the ordinal approach came into being. That's a topic we're not talking about for a little while more to come. Next question will be how do things go with decision on the risk. That will be in a follow-up uh, file. So I stop here.